Oh, welcome, welcome. We're so excited today. We have Amy Lee from Dance for Healing. And Amy, if you could just introduce yourself to our audience, who you are and what you're doing in this world. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Lee, founder and CEO of Dance for Healing. Um, it started because my own trajectory of life, um, you know, recovering from stage four cancer that personally benefit a lot from creative arts um, and, you know, really accelerate my recovery and, and surprise my doctors. So after that, I just left my cushy corporate job, uh, which is mostly focused on innovation that bring my technology innovation background in AI research and behavior design to make healthy habits accessible, supported, and fun for patients like me and elderly like my mom. So here I am, champion for the arts. <laughs> in nice. <public> That's <laughs> awesome. Um, so we like to start every conversation off with a question. And so the question we're using today as our jumping off point is, what happens to your body on art? So in whatever way, whatever that inspires, what, what mm -hmm. happens to your body on art? Yeah. So I think you asked the right person because I oftentimes, uh, my funny way of describing myself is um, I can't resist music. If you turn it on, I'm going to stop moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you definitely asked the right person for that question. Um, I think art has an innate ability to reach human soul. You know, regardless whether it's, you know, writing poetry, painting, drawing, or music, you know, or dance, right? Like, you know, I joke around, it's like, you can walk around and like reading your phone, right? But you can't dance <laughs> trying to read your phone, <laughs> right? <laughs> See? That's true. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, all jokes aside, I think R has a very unique way to, uh, to reach human in a much, much deeper way for our you know, back all the old times of ancient humanity up until now. Yeah. And you guys probably noticed like, you know, the Italians started to, you know, singing outside their windows and That's then, right. right? Okay. And then, yeah, yeah, all dance on the patio with their neighbors, you know, when the pandemic happened, you know, so you see when, when our humanity is threatened, we naturally go back to art. Yeah. Can, I'm interested. Can you go back to, so you love music and you love dancing, but how did you know that would like, heal you how did that kind of switch turn on for you so to be honest at the time i wasn't fully realizing it i just utilize it i mean honestly mm -hmm. um my mom tell a fun story that when i was maybe four or five uh that she took me to visit my grandma in the you know old chinese countryside the courtyard houses and so she went to took a nap which is typical like the chinese yes that um, and I was a little kid, so I couldn't I couldn't sleep, obviously. So I saw a group of adults were doing chores in the other side of Koya. So I went up to them, introduced myself, started dancing and singing for them. Mm. Wow. It was very innate in my body, right? And so when my mom woke up, she thought it was a proper time to introduce myself to everyone. And everybody just looked at me and started laughing. It's like, oh, yeah, we already know her. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is, uh, despite of that, uh, in Chinese culture, we normally don't see R as like a, a living choice or career option, right? Mm. It's mm. like, it's, you know, because Chinese culture does very, you know, value heavily on stability, right? So R is like a side hobby. And so I mm. technically won a public speech contest when I was 12. And mm. so this is like sound in China very male dominant and so when the teacher identified a girl that is not that shy that she could put on stage they, they put me a lot on stage so I was dancing singing mm. you know do kind all kinds of stuff and I was nearsighted so I couldn't see beyond the stage so I was like a little kid going up there <laughs> reading a poetry dancing, <laughs> singing do whatever the teacher asked me to do and and then you know it suddenly built up a lot of my confidence right but when I was reaching like, you know, um, more like a senior high school about to prepare for my college interest exam, this is like a most important um, exam that a student will take to determine pretty much their like life trajectory, whether mm -hmm. you're going to get into a good college or not. And it's in the most intense three days in the hardest summer, wow. you know, <laughs> that you have to like, do this concentrate 
six subject test, right? Oh and my. so, right. And so because of that, you know, as soon as like I get to maybe even like the two years before that final exam, my parents was like, uh-uh, no more dancing, no oh. more singing, nothing, mm. focus on school, mm -hmm. <laughs> no performance, nothing, right? Um, and, you know, so to my surprise, um, I really kind of left sort of my, I don't even know if it was a dream or just like my sort of childhood innate love for arts um, for a long time until I came to the U.S. Uh, because I unfortunately, during that exam, I had a his like, what do you call it? Heat stroke or something, like whatever you call it, like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so I was hospitalized and what? I was on IV. <laughs> and what? I still go back to the test. So I didn't score as high as my normal score. Mm -hmm. So I went to two-year college in China and I came to the U.S. And so because of immigration uh, to the U.S., I actually went back to study graphic design, which is something that relate more to kind of what I love to right. do. Instead mm -hmm. of like in China, I would study taxation management. Very, very, mm -hmm. very, very far away from mm -hmm. the arts, right? But my dad was super happy because, you know, you get a government job, you know, like work for like the IRS um, and it's well paid, it's highly respected, right? Um, but mm -hmm. that wasn't really what my heart is calling for, right? And so, you know, one thing I really appreciate coming to the U.S., you know, is that I do have a really good college counselor. I studied in community college and mm -hmm. while I was working selling pots and pans to, uh, to supermarkets, mostly Asian supermarket, mm -hmm. to pay for my college tuition to really get my, you know, life started in the U.S. Um, and luckily, my counselor, uh, when I told him, hey, my friend told me that there's this major I can draw on a computer. What is that? <laughs> like, I like to do that. Wow. And then he was like, oh, you, you mean graphic design? That's actually not a computer degree. That's a, that's a fine art degree. And then mm -hmm. I got scared. I was like, oh, uh, I don't think I have any art training. I literally do not believe I have any art training, despite the fact I've been doodling since I was a young child. Mm -hmm. I was fascinating with the like, ancient Chinese woman's hairstyle, all kinds mm -hmm. of jewelry on top of their hair. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was my classic, you know, like doodling across like, you know, probably the... Mm -hmm. Uh, junior high school um, and then I had a friend who's also really into doodling so we would compare like you know her little Asian women you know portraits versus right. mine and see who does better and kind of inspire each other um, so I did that and then uh, one time when I was in a political science class I was doodling obviously and my teacher noticed that I wasn't paying attention to the class so he came by and he realized, oh shit, like my <laughs> my book, my political science book was filled with little, little figures mm. of these Asian women with fancy hairs. So guess what? I was punished by, you know, being called to stand in mm. front of the blackboard mm. in a circle in front of the class as a punishment that, that you know, that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't doing a student supposed to do. Right. So, one, so no wonder you're afraid of a little bit afraid of pursuing art, right? You didn't really get a ton of messaging that it was. Yeah, a you, thing, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, and I think as a kid, you you kind of I mean you can't tell a kid not to draw on the on a I don't know on a wall on a bathroom. Right? As a kid, you don't mm. really think about that. You just like oh, there's a paper. Like I'm just gonna start doodling. Mm. So that's kind of what I did, right? And right now, now I probably would not draw on a book, but it's a child. <laughs> I didn't really care, right? Um, and then the other thing also is really interesting. That did not build up any of my confidence either. What's interesting is I actually was one of the main person who did all the illustrations and their paper design for our um, classroom paper. Mm -hmm. uh, that published in the back of our, you know, so in, I don't know how it is in here. So in Chinese classroom used to be like black wall, white charts. Mm -hmm. So in the mm -hmm. front is the teacher's teaching in the back is the student published like a news newsletter mm -hmm. or whatever, like a paper, whatever you mm -hmm. call it. Um, usually, um, I think it's usually every week. And I was the main person who did that for six years in mm -hmm. high school. And wow. then there's a competition 
between different classroom. Because in China, our classroom is consistent, always that same room. And then the same students go there for three years. And then, mm -hmm. you know, then that's right. junior high and then three years for the high school, right? Um, <laughs> so we won all kinds of competition. We got invited to publish this, the all the school's newspaper, which is like, you know, the main, um, name main like what do you call it driveway into the school there's this giant school mm -hmm. newspaper on the wall right that we get invited to be published because we won the other competition right wow i did that too but despite all of that because yeah. i was always doing it myself i mean mm -hmm. took a few classes but none of those uh experience i was guided by like official training or anything and right. so when my teacher here, um, the college counselor told me, oh, that's a fine art degree. And I was like, oh, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have any art training. Even though it had been integrated in your entire life. Mm -hmm. right. That's so in interesting that you had that perspective. Okay. Right. So then if you, so did you go for the graphic design? Yeah, I did. And okay. so luckily he was so good. He told me. Well, so I know you not feel confident. Um, and the good news is a lot of these art classes could be like college credit as a general credit. So you could go take it and then it will apply as your college credit. If you don't like it, you don't have to go to graphic design. You know, this still apply as your general credit. If you like it, then you can apply for graphic design. And then he told me about this program at Cal State Long Beach, you know, which is like one of the top eight graphic design program in the country but I didn't realize it was so hard to get in <laughs> so so anyway and and I think one thing also really good is um they recommend our career center recommend that we do uh career interviews so we interview uh you know some of the other graphic designers like really kind of learn about their career I actually recently was organizing you know moving back to LA organizing my college you know all like old stuff right mm -hmm. came across one of their uh, lady that we interview <laughs> that she is a graphic designer I actually cut that thing her on LinkedIn hey do you remember me <laughs> like, wow yeah it was, it was really interesting so anyway that was helpful and then I also drove down all the way to Kelsey Long Beach to visit the school talk to the professor to like kind of really learn about what it takes to be major in that right um and then I took a bunch of like fine art classes like drawing painting 2d design 3d design light drawing you know which I was very shy to like mm -hmm. you know as Chinese we don't see people naked normally <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go to a class and, and I, mm -hmm. I don't even think like throughout the whole class I speak much because I was <laughs> shocked Oh my gosh, keep drawing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it was really interesting. It's like a lot of models, they, they do it because they also artists themselves, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. during the boy, yeah. they pull on the towel when they walk around, they would come to look at our drawing and, and they were like, you know, have like a little casual conversation with us. And I was always like, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think I feel like every art every art student has had that experience for sure for sure right yeah <laughs> so it's really interesting yeah so anyway uh the good news is um throughout all my art classes I was one of the top students mm -hmm. so that gives me a lot of validation yeah so that yeah. that gives me a lot of confidence to like actually really apply for for this super difficult to get in program and finally got in um, yeah, and, and that set up my foundation for design. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, it. I mean, it seems like art is a force in your life. I mean, I think as artists, art is a force. It's like a, a force of nature and it just couldn't go away. Although you were saying that your culture was like, no, <laughs> but yeah, just such a big force of nature that you, you, you had to do it. And do you feel like, this is a personal question about your own cancer. Do you yeah. feel like that squashing of your art which was squashed led to getting sick possibly and not expressing yourself on a full level um I'm I don't think it was that mm -hmm. I think it was more the um the stress the career stress oh. that I have personal mm -hmm. life stress mm -hmm. um 
because technically, even though I wasn't doing traditional art, I was um I started as art director at Yahoo. Then I was uh, a user experience director in large design agencies. Um, and then I was a senior UX director. But my last job, my boss is one of the most abusive boss ever. Yeah, and you don't want to work with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I stress. sort of become like a um, stress. Like yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because mm-hmm. you still had an, you still had an art influenced job. Yeah, and they didn't, they didn't necessarily abide by, I guess, my viewpoint of art. I mean, art to me is a, is a tool for getting all of that stress out of you mm-hmm. and yeah. then to, to see that there are art art jobs out there that are actually causing stress, stress is really <laughs> it's really hard to I mean that's how like honestly when you mentioned the figure drawing class right that was my yeah. experience in art school was uh-huh. that it was stressful and I just I felt so removed from that process because I had never felt that way about art. Art was never that for me. Art had always been this tool for self-expression and to have this conversation with myself and to heal those wounds that I didn't even understand at the time. And so I feel like we have such an interesting conversation, you know, like, like, uh, just a, like, we're not really connecting all the dots necessarily in the whole world in terms of art. Uh, Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. And this is why I think you write on the spot in a sense that when I got sick, and this is like, you know, when I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, obviously, it's like literally at the bottom of life, right? Like yeah. your life, like, you know, I wrote this piece about cancer box, and I was like, the clock is ticking, like Sabino Dali's um, mm. wall, mm-hmm. literally, it's right. like tripping, right? There's yeah. no sense of time. It's like, every day, you just like go to the hospital, go do the treatment, come back, make sure you still have the energy to either sometimes to sit or or lie down, right? And then, you know, it's one day at a time. And yeah. so what's interesting is when I didn't draw for maybe like 12 years until I got mm-hmm. sick, like, you know, because when I was working mostly in technology, we do digital, you know, graphic right. design, right? It's computer, right? Like I haven't even touched, you know, brushes for a while. Mm-hmm. So I pick up my art brushes after 12 years. Mm-hmm. I started writing poetry, which is mm-hmm. I'm committed to getting my book published. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Love it. And, you know, the funny thing is like when I was young, I wrote like a little Chinese poetry and I showed it to my older sister. And then she looked at it. I thought it was really good. Like in my mind, in my whatever <laughs> the, the kid's mind. Yeah, uh, like, you know, it was like something about hungry for this this great apple garden in your dreams or something like that. Um, and then she was like, "Well, maybe you want to write when you have more life experience." <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had a poem uh called Stage Four uh Stage, mm-hmm. um, and actually recently um I just got accepted into Harvard's uh, effective writing program, and that was the writing sample that required mm-hmm. to submit, and I choose to submit that one. Because it, oh, it encapsulates my the spirit of my book really well because I'm comparing right. the stage of life to the stage of performing art to the stage of cancer. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's like very sort of methodical, right? Like you know, sort of kind of looking in different areas in life, right? Um, and um, so back to when I was sick, you know, and and so to your key point, right? Like you know, when it about ba- when it back to this very sort of human survival instinct Mm -hmm. we go back to art just like you know the italian dance the same thing is when humanity Mm -hmm. is dreaded when my living my life life of death is being Mm -hmm. dreaded i go back to my innate desire for the arts um i pick up my art brushes after 12 years i listen to music when i'm bedridden when i'm in chemo when i'm nervous right uh, mm-hmm. I appreciate even like when I have to go into surgery, they have like a little bit of music, they have like a little mm-hmm. bit of art mm-hmm. on the seating mm-hmm. to kind of calm the patient down, right? Um, and then the only exercise program that I was allowed to attend because my immune system is severely compromised, right? It was at the cancer center and it happened to be a music and dance program. 
So, mm. so, uh, so that's why, like, you know, uh, it, it just kind of like, you know, it's been like distant from me for so long. All of a sudden, every single modality came back to support mm. me, you know. Um, and part of the challenges that I realized, even though on the good day, I can make it to the cancer center and attend that class. But on the days that I couldn't make it, you know, I was too sick to go or don't have a volunteer driver. Then I have no activity for several weeks, right? And this is why it inspired me to build this technology platform that allow people to have access to music, dance, and art when they're stuck at home, you know, for patients like me or elderly like my mom, right? So when I, to answer your question, like, do I know, how do I know that a salary my recovery at the time, in the midst of that, I have no clue. Mm -hmm, I was right. just doing what my heart mm -hmm. is desire for, right? Mm -hmm. But looking back, I realized that make a huge difference for me. Um, and specifically, <laughs> uh, one year after I finished my cancer treatment, um, I was at our school's uh, pool party. And so I I attended this uh, graduate study program at Singular University at NASA. And halfway through that program, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, right? Yes. So you can see all my classmates and faculty were really worried about me. Mm -hmm. And so at that pool party a year after, our uh, leadership director came up to me and he said, Amy, I'm so happy to see you here because when I went to Stanford to see you in the hospital, I was so worried about you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you came to Stanford to see me? I didn't mm. know because I was so sick. I was, right. you know, passed mm -hmm. out because I had a complication from my feeding tube surgery. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The doctor left too much air in my diaphragm and it was so right. painful. So, you know, they discharged me. And, but, you know, their other hospital where I went to get my radiation treatment, they looked at me and they're just like, she does not look right. Like, wow. you know, send her back to their hospital because well, our other faculty was supporting me, right? And so I ended up was in a hospital for like uh, a whole week. Um, they were waiting to see if the air would kind of fart it out, but it doesn't work mm -hmm. because it's in the diaphragm. So eventually they had to drill another hole to suck wow. out all the air in my diaphragm. Um, and then halfway through that, that process, this is the, our leadership director visited me, but I was so sick. I have no clue that he was actually there. Wow. And because what happened, is the doctor who's care for me told him he was worried if I can make it through the end of the year. And that was five months. So this uh -huh. was July, 2012. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to end the year, that was five months. Wow. See, 10 years later, I'm still here telling you guys mm -hmm. the story yeah. and still singing and dancing, right? So, so do I know that actually a salary? Well, I don't know for sure, but there is evidence. The doctors worry if I could even make it to five months. And here I am, right? I, right. I, I recover. You know, and the funny thing is that each time when I go back to the doctor, they'll be like, you're looking good. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell you until like five years later, congratulations. You know, because with cancer, sometimes you never know what's going to come right. out. Right. right. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm definitely a living evidence of how, arts can really contribute to human health yeah yeah okay so tell tell us about um dance for healing a little bit and you, you talked about developing technology to help people when they're on their own when they can't leave the home so how does that work yeah so um right after yahoo uh, i was an art director at yahoo uh then i was recruited by at&t interactive r and d um and we were like a little bit, sort of like a small lab on a giant shoulder, the large AT&T labs, right? Mm -hmm. And so we do all kinds of technology experiments, um, you know, AI, you know, all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff like voice recognition and all of that. Um, my first iPhone app was actually featured in New York Times. Guess mm -hmm. what it's called? <laughs> it saw <laughs> the basic human knee and it was on St. Patrick's Day. Can you wow. guys guess? Mm -hmm. No, so it's a basic human knee. So it's a basic human knee. Uh, what do people do on St. Patrick's Day? Celebrate? Um. <laughs> you celebrate? Drink? <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're on the topic. So what do people like, do after they drink? 
what are they they well i feel like they drink and they chant and they dance around and they go on a Joy. parade and what's the basic human need after they drink they go to the bathroom yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so the app is actually gonna have to pee they already have to pee <laughs> without an it. ee <laughs> <laughs> anyway so it was literally an experiment app because technically this is like 2009 right um when a lot of dot-com crashed a lot of business closed mm -hmm. you know and so at&t bought yellowpages.com and so we were trying to figure out which category local search has a lot of pool and so we have restaurant data we have hotel data we have gas station mm -hmm. Um, and we had this fun idea, like, oh, nobody had bathroom data. We, we do have some. <laughs> <laughs> we have it, right? And so we thought, okay, maybe it'd be fun to build this app called Have to Pee, like looking for bathrooms, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. No, I mean, seriously, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then thanks for the graphic design school I went to, which is literally one of the top eight programs in the country. I, I designed this logo on the uh, loading screen of the app Mm -hmm. is i i modify the traditional bathroom sign into like a late cost figure <laughs> so basically they were doing like a little sort of pp dance you know like when people get nervous <laughs> like dance. Okay. <laughs> anyway yeah it was hilarious so anyway um <laughs> so our app without much promotion it got picked up first by NBC Chicago. It went on to New York Times, being featured as wow. app of the week. Uh, technically, they featured two bathroom search app, but they use my graphic. Wow. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so the other funny part is, uh, we had like a um, this sort of urgency detector because you know this is like at the beginning of Apple iPhone uh, app design, right? Like you know when Apple actually opened up uh, application design for developers, right? And so, so there's a function where you could build uh, where you shake the phone in doing something. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is when you shake the phone, you have to pee really bad. <laughs> and we'll find you in the closest bathroom. <laughs> so anyway, oh and then we call it urgency detector. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so New York Times suddenly had a good uh, fun uh, you know, <laughs> capture of that, like, oh, here, yeah, I guess what is even an urgency detector. If you want to just keep shaking your phone. So anyway, uh, so, so yeah, so it started by New York Times and then it, it got picked up by other, you know, major media. And then, um, and then like, you know, um, there's like some article on Gizmodo. It's like, um, have to be with say your underpants. <laughs> uh, and then, and then like, the funniest backstory is this is supposed to be an experiment app, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So initially, our at and you know, R&D does not have an official developer's title, you know, in our app store, right? Like mm -hmm. not the developer name, it wasn't officially at and but because we're getting so much media. Mm -hmm. um, and then we started putting the name AT&T Interactive r and <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the app. And so a few weeks later, this article came out saying AT&T want to help you pee. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's all the fun stories. So that just give you a little bit, you know, sort of um, idea about, you know, how we use a lot of experimental technologies and AI. And so... The quick follow up after that is we use the traffic to long take a whole suite of have to apps. So, like, have to eat, have to drink, mm -hmm. have to snack, you know, all these different type of stores, right? Mm -hmm. um, and apparently, have to eat is everybody love to eat. And so, it surpassed mm -hmm. all the traffic so all of a sudden. And so, our um, researcher scientists in AI was able to use AI model to train uh, the app to automatically review the restaurants based on the data that we pulled from like other, um, you know, user feedbacks or, you know, review data. So we could rate a restaurant based on five different aspects. Like for example, the atmosphere, the, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever the quality of food, right? <laughs> you know? And yeah. then we also use that experiment to discover a lot of discrepancy because we have the data scientists occasionally go and check it. And I design an interface where there's a self-report data. Like you could say, you know, the rating of the restaurant by thumbs up, thumbs down, and you know, whatever, right? <laughs> but our machine learning is 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 pull all these data from the prior reviews. 
So if we identify there's a di discrepancy between the self-report data, which is you tap, you know, a little right. button, right? Versus the machine learning data. So for example, you could say the restaurant, the atmosphere is okay, but I don't know why the machine review says it is really good. And mm -hmm. so our data scientists can go in and pull and say, oh, um, actually somebody have a comment like, oh, today's such a beautiful day. My girlfriend smells so good. Mm -hmm. You know, I love her flower dress or whatever. That, that not that has anything to do with the restaurant mm -hmm. atmosphere, but a mm -hmm. machine will pull those keywords and categorize it right. as a high quality atmosphere and stuff, right? So we use that experiment to like really learn a lot intricacy about how do I as a designer to utilize my skill to help you know, improve the AI algorithms and, you know, like, uh, and then there's also a lot of behavior design, like, you know, kind of learning from not just like the urgency of using the bathroom, but also <laughs> right. different behavior, how mm -hmm. user do the search, right? Because we also have another app um, called Speak For It, where you don't really speak and on your app. And this is back in 2009, where mm -hmm. there's barely any voice talking mm -hmm. apps, right? But you could have pulled up your phone and say, find me the nearest uh, gas station, you know, like, you know, and then we work with speech recognition, uh, the, you know, scientists in the at and lab to like literally, um, you know, figuring out what are different scenario and user behavior when they search for things, right? So a lot of these in my background now is actually being adapted and implemented into our AI who just received allowance, um, you know, from uh, USPTO. And I actually was invited to speak uh, at USPTO's um, Asian American um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, mm -hmm. you know, as a keynote speaker, awesome. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and I wrote a very emotional um, LinkedIn post because my dad is a geomathematician. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of the reason I grew up, like, you know, having this education that heavily focused on STEM is because of my father, right? And my, my mom is a teacher. Unfortunately, my dad passed away from lung cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so like, you know, when USPTO introduced me as an inventor, mm -hmm. you know, it just feels so good. Like, oh, my dad must be proud of me. Mm -hmm. right? like, that's, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Having his youngest daughter being called as an inventor. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our, um, you know, back to the for heating, our AI is patented um, and our oh. goal is really to make sure people have different preference, different health conditions, different you know, emotion chef, different body energy, like all these different, you know, variety of assess accessibility, mobility needs, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. being met through our technology. So we could personalize music and dance and art tailored to individuals' needs. And if you look at the industry, majority of fitness program, unfortunately, they design for fit people, right? right. <laughs> really, yeah. they're targeting people with different you know, accessibility or mobility needs, right? Um, yeah. The only one out there may be like PT, but, you know, I myself is guilty of like not really doing PT myself, right? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I'm not alone. Like, you know, when I was uh, part of their Stanford uh, Design for Dance class where, you know, uh, the conference organizer invited the, one of the top executives in Kaiser, you know, and he was pretty, pretty excited, you know, like when we discuss dance as like a healing modality and one of the most effective way of change behavior because he mm -hmm. was also saying like yeah you know i have all these pt exercises prescribed to me and guess how many times i did and right. we were trying to guess and he goes like zero zero <laughs> yeah no for yeah. sure right yeah so you know and so part of our, our mission is really making healthy habits accessible supported and mm -hmm. fun in reaching right. the people of yeah. all abilities age, race, and gender. Yeah. So that's not, that's that, make a difference. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so mm -hmm. Dance for Healing is a movement. And then how do people get a hold of you? Like, is it through the hospital system or through, how does, how does that happen? Yeah. So our long-term mission is really um, maximize the opportunity for all the beneficiaries. As a patient, I recognize that asking patient to pay is not an ideal uh, you know, um, sort of long-term sustainable way. And so our long-term goal is to like say government procurement, value-based care, uh, insurance reimbursement, 
-hmm. And as you probably understand, healthcare is moving very slowly, yeah. right? Yes. So, so that is still in the work. And we definitely got introduced to uh, BA. You know, I had a mentor who actually used to be the uh, former president of ARP, who's been incredibly supportive, introduced me to a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we also get in quite a bit of traction. Right now we got funded by NIH, um, recruiting mm -hmm. minority diabetic. And so this will ver verify the efficacy and help us move to this, you know, validation of getting insurance reimbursed or value-based care. Um, at the same time, you know, we also targeting other easier to adapt in like the corporate wellness programs. Um, and during COVID, we also started a community health program. Um, and so we have like 375 people signed up. The yeah. only challenge is this kind of program without funding support, it's difficult for us to keep it long-term sustainable, right? right? And so yeah, my immediate urgency at the moment is to fulfill our recruitment needs for the NIH study. And so this is funded by National Insurance Minority Health and Health Disparity. Uh, and we are recruiting minority diabetics, the caregiver, the caregiver must be living in the same household with them because for, you know, for prevention concerns and safety, this is a 100% online study uh, that we need to ensure the safety protocol is set up to protect patients when they do it at home. Um, and then we were match them to an intergenerational buddy uh, that is compatible to them based on, you know, the initial survey for their preference and, you know, whatever they need, right? Um, and then um, from that, they would receive a fitness watch because we're going to track uh, their activities. Um, and they will also receive an orange scale. Um, the scale will help them track their BMI, their weight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you probably know diabetes patients, they need to constantly monitor their weight and mm -hmm. uh, they also right. blood sugar levels, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, they get to attend our AWE program once we updated the platform based on their preference for the initial group got interviewed. Um, and we'll gather those feedback and update the platform. And then we'll launch this, our signature AWE Mindful Movement Program. Uh, so this is a program that achieved high success uh, when I first started at the Stanford Cancer Program, that we actually mm -hmm. got net promoter score 91, oh, compared wow. to healthcare 24. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, and we also track like, uh, anxiety, depression reductions, um, you know, uh, body energy level improvement, mm -hmm. pain reduction. Majority of the people reported from zero to four, uh, they report either three or four. So that means 80 to 100% improvement. Oh. That's just really Absolutely. encouraging. You know, it makes me happy that to see so much benefit that our patient received. Um, mm -hmm. And things for that uh, initial pilot data, we were able to apply for NIH funding and then we right. it. And then, how, go ahead. You are, you have a question. Ask how many how many people are you hoping to get into this current NIH study? So What's technically, not not that many. But mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, I realized because we're targeting minorities, um, it's actually harder, uh, than just you know general population right. to recruit mm -hmm. patients. And we do encounter some slowness of recruitment partners that are large healthcare institute that moving very very slowly. Um, mm -hmm. So technically, it's thirty participants. Um, okay. That, yeah, that um, with ten patient, ten caregiver, um, and then ten intergenerational buddy. Mm -hmm. So it's like twenty households, thirty participants uh -huh. total. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so the the it feels to me like you're combining. You're like it's like you, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you have a you have your like innate. Uh, like you, you talked about your innate drive towards movement and art, and, but then you have the, um, the STEM side, right? The yeah. computer, the AI, and it's like, you've combined it, um, in a way that is accessible, your hope, right? Um, and you're, you're almost, you're at the point where you're almost trying to prove the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. You're at that point where you're like, you know, I mean, let's get this straight. Like Lisa and I talk about this all the time. We know, we already know 
yeah. that aren't heals people, right? But it's great that you're going to that research side of it because the more right. research and science we can have that basically proves what we all we already know um, sounds awesome. So um, I, you know, we'll put all your information so people can reach out to you to be in yeah. the study. That would be excellent. Yeah, and and honestly, it's really easy. You know, thanks to my design communication background, <laughs> it's <laughs> literally just and I just study that danceforheating.com. Um, just remember, right. dance for heating is the number four, not F O R. Yeah, so it has like a video about the program, mm-hmm. a little bit information about uh, you know, like what are we focused on, um, and then what are you gonna get from the program? It's I would say on average there were patient will get about. Um, an individual will get seven hundred fifty dollar value. Um, you know, with the free for our program, they also get the fitness watch and on scale. Um, they also get like a little you know gift card at the end, twenty five dollars. So all adds up about seven hundred fifty. Um, and then if it's each household, they only get one on scale because they can share the same scale, mm-hmm. right? On average, they, that's probably maybe slightly less than seven hundred fifty. Um, but in general. Um, you know, each household will probably get. I lost the actual data, but it's somewhere about <laughs> thirteen hundred to fifteen hundred, and then each individual will get like maybe seven fifty if it's not in the same household. Yeah, That's mm-hmm. powerful. I mean, yeah. what you're doing mm-hmm. is the now, but also the future. I mean, as we yeah, you know our populations get older and older, we're not going to be, you know, out there. So yeah, absolutely, and I think you definitely own the very important key point is um part of the reason what I do is my mom is getting older, right? Um, she's eighty two, but according to her own Chinese um way of calculating <laughs> age, you know, she thinks she's eighty four because Chinese calculate the ten months in your stomach as your age too, right? Um, and you know, I moved back to LA during COVID. I was generally just like, okay, I get to spend some time with my family, but I'm still here because I realized my mom really needs care, right? And so I yeah. pretty much, the the biggest thing that I'm proud of is during COVID, I was able to spend time with my mom. I changed her entire care to a completely mm-hmm. different medical system, change her medicine and everything, right? You know, and so people like me or elderly like my mom, you know, we really need accessible, you know, engaging platform that easy to access, right? Mm-hmm. So our app, you know, things for my design background and mm-hmm. user experience, everybody looked at it so simple, you just push a few buttons. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, I think that's great. I think, uh, you know, I, I do think that focusing on our health, right? Uh, yeah. It can be physical, mental, emotional. Yeah. yeah. The, more user friendly we can make it. Yes. Uh, the more accessible we can make it, the, the yes. better for all of us, right? As yeah. we know, you make the individual better, you make the world better. Mm-hmm. So I I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah. So the the exciting news is uh, with the NIH one. So we build their bio tracking integration and a culturally sensitive AI, right? Um, our other proposal currently pending is actually building Alexa. So wow. imagine mm-hmm. an elderly could say, Alexa, lock me into dance for healing. Uh, and then, you know, like our app, do Alexa can ask them, do voice, how do you feel right now? And I right. already shared part of my project um, in at and is actually voice recognition. So I'm kind of mm-hmm. going back to a technology I'm already familiar with. So mm-hmm. that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other one that we currently got funded, a tiny little one, is actually from a Chinese community health association that we are building a language integration uh, mm. for people like my mom with English to Chinese mm. translation. Oh, yeah. So nice. the video, uh-huh. yeah, they because, you know, music, dance, and art had no mm-hmm. border, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. my mom can still watch a little video and trying to imitate a movement. But it will be helpful if the instructor say something mm-hmm. that she could either read or hear, it, right? Mm-hmm. And so we recently just do like a little a prototype of a, a one of our dance video with like you know screen cap, you know like transcription. And I show it to my mom. It's like, hey, mom, what do you think? You know, like she's like, oh yeah, good. You know, now I can understand what you're saying. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> right? Yeah. So see, that's another another thing about accessibility, right? Like you know, because in this country, 
unfortunately minority especially mm -hmm. those with language barrier immigrants yeah. right mm -hmm. they also suffer from more severe health disparities right? right and so our next um expansion once we accomplish the chinese one we actually targeting spanish so right. english spanish mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you probably already know spanish love to dance right yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, music, dance, and art is so rich in the culture, right? You know, so that yeah. will be our next expansion to that. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great to hear uh, some of your story and see how you're, I mean, it, it makes sense why you are where you are. And thank you for what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And I love uh, your interview too. And thank you so much for your commitment you know, to yeah. bring arts and awareness, you know, to all the people who listen to the podcast and who will be all over the world. And I definitely <laughs> I love it. your work. <laughs> we are a movement. Thank you so much. Yeah. 